What made you believe in Christianity versus any other personal religions? Okay, very good. I'll, I'll get to that more um, next week, I think, uh, as we talk about why I believe in Jesus. Because most, uh, most of my thinking um, you know, about why to follow Christianity um, is tied to my reasons for thinking that Jesus Christ is Lord, and a lot of those are historical reasons. But I'll say this at this point. Um, the story of, this was a, a central intuition piece. This wasn't the whole reason why I believed, but it was one thing that got me going. Um, there was a time where I was uh, wrestling with all this stuff, and, and the issue that we talked about last week, the problem of evil, was really still the major obstacle that I had to really having, coming to faith in uh, a personal God. And there was one night at the, on a building uh, in, at the University of Minnesota where we're studying in an astronomy class the moons of Jupiter, but in the process we're talking about the galaxies and, and the stars and the expanse of the universe and all those sorts of things. And I was overwhelmed by the grandeur of it all and the design of it all. I was also impressed with the fact that after the, uh, the astronomer uh, kind of gave us the whole story of the Big Bang and all that stuff exploding, um, and I knew he was an atheist from other discussions that we'd had, and he was always kind of poking fun at the idea of a God. And, I, and he said, you know, the whole universe was packed into this super com compressed, you know, uh, a ball of matter. It's the size of a pinhead, perhaps. And then it exploded. And I had the gall to ask in, in this class on top of this building, studying the moons of Jupiter and talking about the universe, I said, where'd the pinhead come from? And, and he and a number of other people in the class uh, laughed, and, and he says, look, at some point, you just got to stop asking questions. <laughs> and so I, I thought to myself, oh, oh, so it's a faith gig. Okay. So, so even you, at some point, come to a point where you just have to accept something. And, and so that kind of impressed me. But I was really overwhelmed with the problem of evil. I, had been, I, I was learning Hebrew in this class uh, at, at, at the U. Um, and they were just in the process of showing this series called The Holocaust uh, on television. And uh, Sophie's Choice had just come out, and we were talking a lot about you know, the Holocaust and the horrors of that. And some of these kids knew uh, their, their uh, grandparents who had uh, gone through Dachau or Auschwitz. And, and so we were talking a lot about this. And so the problem of evil was really, you know, gripping me. At the same time, this, this longing to believe in a personal God was gripping me. And as I walked home, as, as I walked to my car on this cold October night, uh, after having been at this astronomy class, I was, my, my brain was racked with this problem of evil and this choice. You know, on the one hand, the grandeur of the universe and my longing for reason and meaning and, and, and value means there has to be a God. On the other hand, you know, children were gassed at Auschwitz. How can there possibly be a, be a God? But, but then again, you know, given the complexity of the human mind and the laws of, of nature, there's got to be a God. But given the terrible evil that happens in the world, it can't be a, a God. And I was going back and forth and back and forth like a ping pong ball, you know, yeah, all, all, tormented, going to my car. And as I was getting into my car, and it's cold October night, I remember partly saying and partly thinking, and I don't know which was which, but expressing to myself and, and to whatever else was out there, that the only way I could possibly believe in you in any kind of meaningful way is if you're not up there looking down on this miserable thing we call human existence. And you're not up there in the bliss of heaven watching these little children get raped and mutilated and tortured and, and, and burned alive. But if you're on the inside of human pain, if, if you're the Sophie who has to choose which child's going to be taken away in the gas chamber and which one's going to live, and you're, you also know from the inside what it is to be the child that wasn't chosen, if you're experiencing the hell of human existence from the inside, then I can perhaps believe in you. But if you're not, I feel a moral obligation to not believe in you. I think a lot of atheists actually disbelieve in God out of that same sense of moral obligation. Uh, it, it's, and so I, that was my mind. I, I was just expressing that. And as I got into my car, you know, maybe it was my thought, my intuition, or maybe it was the Lord speaking to me, but the thought occurred to me that that is exactly the God that Christianity preaches. And no other religion does it. The cross, the idea, the, the incredible, mind-boggling idea that the almighty creator God, 
who spoke, according to the Bible, everything in existence and holds everything in existence, would become one of us little human beings on this little tiny speck of dust called earth and enter into the hell of our existence. That's what the cross is all about. In order to then restore and redeem us, uh, that's a God who experiences hell from the inside. And there's no other teaching in the world that I know of, and I've studied world religions quite a bit, that says that. And so at that moment, you know, if I was going to believe in a personal God, it would have to be one who knows suffering from the inside, and that leads me to take seriously the cross. Even if I didn't think that this was historical, if the Gospels weren't historical, I would, if I was going to believe in God, have to believe that this is the greatest myth that we have about what he's like. And then, as we'll see next week, I have a lot of reasons for thinking that, in fact, it is historically true. But that was the major turning point.